Hi friends, my name is Josie and I'm a librarian with the Deschutes Public Library and today we are doing a reading of part of The Van de Beekers of 141st Street and this is by Karina Glasser. We're just going to do a little reading of um, the first chunk of it um, just to see if we can get interested into it, get into it and see if we might enjoy it. It's a funny, amusing book with some delightful characters living in New York City. Um, I look at 140, 141st Street and think, wow, I can't even imagine having that many streets. But um, it's a different world. And so we'll learn a little bit about it and what it's like to live in New York City. So it does have a couple of pictures. Um, I'll try to show those as best I can. Um, but you can get a copy of this book from Deschutes Public Library, either the paper version like this or the electronic downloadable version. So you can see those pictures close up if you need to. So let's go ahead and get started. Now the very first part has a map of Harlem and the South Bronx and there's a lot of details in there so I'm not going to put it right up next to the camera but definitely if you like maps worth perusing <clears throat> uh, when you get your own coffee at home to finish it up. So this book is organized by dates. We're going to start out with Friday December 20th. Um, and just so you know, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of talking in this book. I'll do my best with all the different uh, characters. Here we go. Chapter one. In the middle of a quiet block on 141st Street, inside a brownstone made of deep red shale, the Vanderbeeker family gathered in the living room for a family meeting. Their pets, a dog named Franz, a cat named George Washington, and a house rabbit named Paganini sprawled on the carpet taking afternoon naps in a strip of sunlight. The pipes rumbled companionably within the brownstone walls. Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The five Vanderbeeker kids looked at their parents. Good news, said Isa and Laney. Bad news, said Jesse, Oliver, and Hyacinth. Righto, Papa said. Good news first. He paused and adjusted his glasses. You kids all know how much mama and I love you, right? Oliver, who is nine years old and wise to the ways of the world, put down his book and squinted. Are you guys getting divorced? Jimmy L's parents got a divorce and then they let him get a pet snake. He kicked the back of his sneakers against the tall stack of ancient encyclopedias he was sitting on. No, we're, Papa began. Is it true? Six-year-old Hyacinth whispered, tears pooling in her round eyes. Of course we're, Mama said. What the doors? interrupted Lainey, who is four and three quarters years old and practicing for her forward rolls on the carpet. She was wearing an outfit of red plaid, lavender stripes, and aqua polka dots that she had matched herself. I'd like to see that. It means Mama and Papa won't love each other anymore, said 12-year-old Jessie, glaring at her parents from behind chunky black eyeglasses. What a nightmare! We'll have to split our time between them, added Isa, Jessie's twin. She was holding her violin and jabbed her brow against the arm, her bow against the arm of the couch. Alternating high holidays and summers and whatnot, I think I'm gonna be sick. Mama threw up her hand. Stop! Just everyone, please stop! Papa and I are not getting a divorce. Absolutely not. We're going about this all wrong. Mama glanced at Papa, took a deep breath, and briefly closed her eyes. Issa noted dark circles under her mom's eyes that hadn't been there the week before. Mama's eyes opened. Let's start over. First, answer this question. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you like living here? The Vanderbeeker kids glanced around at their home, a brownstone, brownstone in Harlem, New York City. It consisted of a basement, a ground floor with a living room that flowed into an open kitchen, a bathroom and a laundry room, and a first floor with three bedrooms, a walk-in closet turned bedroom where Oliver lived and another bathroom all lined up in a row. A door on the ground floor opened up to a skinny backyard where a mama cat and her new litter of kittens made their home under the hydrangea bush. The kids considered mama's questions. 10, Jesse, Isa, and Hyacinth, and Lainey replied. A million, said Oliver, still squintingly suspicious at his parents. It's the best place in the world, reported Lainey, who somersaulted again and knocked down Isa's 
music stand. The pets scattered, except for Franz, who didn't flinch, despite now being covered in sheet music. We've lived here most of our lives, said Isa. It's a perfect home. Except the Biederman, of course, added Jesse. The Biederman lived on the Brownstone's third floor. He was a seriously unpleasant man. He was also their landlord. Mr. Biederman, Papa corrected Jesse. And funny you should mention him. Papa stood up and started pacing the length of the couch. His face was so grim that his ever-present smile creases disappeared. I didn't see this coming, but Mr. Biederman just told me he's not renewing our lease. He's not renewing our... Jesse started. What a punk, shouted Oliver. What's a lease? asked Lainey. Papa continued as if the kids hadn't spoken. Now you have all done a great job this past year respecting Mr. Biederman and his need for privacy and quiet, he said. I mean, I thought for sure he would have kicked us out a couple of years ago when Oliver hit that baseball through his window, window or when Franz used his front door like a fire hydrant. I'm surprised he's making us leave now after a spotless record this year. Papa paused and peered at his children. The kids nodded and looked at, back at him with innocent eyes, all except for Oliver, who was hoping no one remembered his little incident earlier that year when a frisbee snapped a sprinkler pipe, causing the blast of water to shoot right into the Biederman's open window. Papa did not bring up the sprinkler incident. Instead, he said, we have to move at the end of the month. The room exploded with indignation. Are you serious? We've been so good, there might as well have been halos over our head, exclaimed Jessie, her glasses slipping down the bridge of her nose. I haven't bounced a basketball in front of the building in months, Oliver said. What's a lease? Lainey asked again. Issa has to practice violin in the freaking dungeon, said Jessie. Language, Mama warned at the same time as Issa said. I like practicing down there. Papa looked at Lainey. We have a lease with Mr. Biederman. It's an agreement between us for living here. Lainey considered what Papa said as she prepped another somersault. So that means he doesn't want us? It's not that. Mama trailed off. I think the Beetleman needs hugs, Lainey decided. She completed an accident-free somersault, then rolled over to lie in her stomach searching for her bunny who had taken refuge under the couch. Jessie glanced at the calendar on the wall. So that's it? We've only got 11 days left here? He's really gonna make us move right after Christmas? Asked Lisa. Is it because I can't keep Franz quiet? Asked Hy Hyacinth as she chewed her fingernails. When Hy Franz heard Hyacinth say his name, his tail wagged a little wag and his eyes fluttered open and then drifted close again. I think it's my fault, Lisa said. Her siblings stared at her. No one could imagine perfect Issa ever being the cause of getting kicked out of their home. You know, because of my violin playing. Kids, it's no one's fault, Mama interjected. Remember how Papa and Uncle Arthur installed those energy-saving windows last year? Those windows are much more soundproof than the old ones. We've done all we can to try to persuade Mr. Biederman to let us stay. I even left a box of lavender macaroons outside his door. Mama blinked rapidly. As a professional pastry chef, she took macaroons very seriously. What a waste, grumbled Oliver, who also took macaroons very seriously. Will our new place have a basement so I can practice? Issa asked. I'm only moving if I can have a science lab in the new place with a Bunsen burner and new Erlenmeyer flasks. Jessie said stubbornly. My room's going to look exactly the same, right? Like exactly? Asked Oliver. Will we move close by so Franz can keep all his doggy friends? Asked Hyacinth. At Hyacinth's comment, the other kids' eyes widened. They'd never considered that they might have to leave the neighborhood where they knew everyone on the block by name, age, and hairstyle. I've lived in this neighborhood my whole life, Papa said. My job is here. Only Hyacinth noticed that he didn't answer her question or look anyone in the eye when he said that. Listen, kids, I have to fix the wobbly banister on the second floor and then take the building trash out, but we're not done talking about this, okay? 
Papa took his worn blue coveralls off the coat hanger and pulled them over the work clothes he was wearing for his computer repair job. The coveralls looked like something an auto mechanic would wear. Papa observed the somber faces of his kids. I'm really sorry about this. I know you love this place, but I promise this will turn out okay. And then he slipped out the door. The kids hated when their parents talked about things turning out okay. How could they know? Before the kids could start in with the questions again, Mama's cell phone pinged. She glanced at the caller, then back at the kids. I have to get this, but don't worry. We'll talk about this more, I promise. The kids watched her rush up the stairs and heard her say, yes, Miss Mitchell, thank you for calling. We're very interested in that apartment you listed, followed by her bedroom door shutting. Move, said Oliver, breaking the silence. That's bananas, rotten Biederman. I can't imagine not living here, Issa said, her fingers running over her violin strings. I really hope it wasn't my violin playing that caused this. Issa had discovered Mr. Biederman's particular distaste for instruments six years ago when she was in first grade. She was performing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on her tiny one eight size instrument for their second floor neighbor. Miss Josie. Issa stood outside Miss Josie's apartment, but halfway through her song, Mr. Biederman's door on the third floor burst open. He yelled down the staircase for the terrible racket to stop or he would call the police. Then the door slammed. The police on a six-year-old violinist. Issa was in tears and Miss Josie invited her in and fed her cookies from a delicate china dish and gave her a pretty lace handkerchief to dry her eyes. Then Miss Josie insisted that Issa keep the handkerchief, which Issa to this day stowed in her violin case. It makes no sense, said Jessie, pacing back and forth between the couch and the picture window. She ran her hands through her wild hair, which made her look like a crazed scientist. Newton's third law says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now consider this. Papa does so much for the building. He keeps the front stoop clean. He rakes the leaves. He shovels the snow. He saves the Biederman so much money by doing all the repairs himself. So what about Newton's third law? The Biederman kicking us out of this building is not an equal reaction. I want to see a Newton, exclaimed Laney. I don't think that a law applies here, said Issa, unconsciously adjusting her neat ponytail into an even neater ponytail. Newton's laws apply to everything, Jessie said with her I'm right, no one can convince me otherwise voice. Uncle Arthur helps with the big repairs, Oliver commented as he searched through the stack of an ancient encyclopedia for the one marked N. Papa does all the daily stuff, Jessie pointed out, and he fixes Uncle Arthur's laptop whenever it breaks. Oliver pulled the correct encyclopedia from the stack and flipped through it. Newton is this guy, he said to Laney, pointing to a photo in the book. He has very nice hair, said Laney, running her fingers over the picture. Don't read that, scolded Jessie. Those books are 60 years old and full of inaccurate science. Okay, people, Issa interrupted. Let's get back on topic. I figure we have until Christmas to convince the Biederman to let us stay. That's only four and a half days, Jessie exclaimed. She looked at her watch. 106 hours. Exactly. Less than five days, people. Who has ideas? Give him lots of hugs, suggested Laney. Oliver rubbed his hands together and raised one eyebrow. Let's spray paint his door. He gave a dramatic pause with disgusting bathroom words. Issa ignored her brother. Laney, I think you're right. We should try to do nice things for the Biederman. You know, change his mind about us. Jesse and Oliver looked skeptical. Hyacinth looked scared. Laney looked ready to give out hugs. Lots of hugs. After a long science, Oliver shrugged. I'd be willing to do nice things for him if he lets us stay. I guess I can try to be nice to him, Jesse said. Issa gave her a grateful look. Although if this doesn't work, Oliver and I totally get to spray paint his door. What do you think, Hyacinth? It scares me, Hyacinth said, chewing on her pinky finger. That's five against one. What could he do to us anyways? I know you can do this, Issa said to Hyacinth. You need to channel Hyacinth the Brave. Hyacinth nodded, but continued gnawing on her pinky. Issa mused. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to convince the Biederman to let us stay? It would be like giving Mama and Papa the most amazing Christmas present ever. 
the Vanderbeeker kids thought about giving their parents the best Christmas present ever. Of course, Hyacinth already made presents for them, but she completed them like two months ago. She liked the idea of, group, of a group gift. Oliver, who had spent quite a bit of time contemplating what he was going to get for Christmas, just remembered that he was expected to give gifts as well. Mama and Papa deserve an amazing present from us, Oliver decided. Let's keep it a secret. Issa looked at him. You haven't gotten them anything yet, have you? Oliver quickly changed the topic. If it's a secret, we need to make sure you know who doesn't spill the beans. He gave a not too discreet nod towards Lainey. Lainey, this is a secret, instructed Jesse. Right, agreed Lainey promptly. Right what, Jesse said. Right, let's be nice to Beaver Smack, Lainey said. Yes, but we're going to keep it a secret from Mama and Papa. Right, Lainey? Jesse prompted, right. The five kids started exchanging ideas for winning over the man on the third floor. Operation Biederman had officially begun. They tried to feel hopeful about their plan, but in the back of each of their minds, they are all thinking the same thing. How do you make friends with a man you have never seen and who has not left his apartment in six years? That was the first chapter of The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street by Karina Glasser. So I hope that got you interested in the book. I'm kind of curious. Why has he never left his apartment in six years? How can you stay in an apartment for six years without leaving? I'm also kind of curious what the five kids are going to do, what they consider nice and how they're going to try to make it work they get to stay in their apartment and I know there's some funny parts coming up but you know me personally I'm wondering if the neighbor Miss Josie is going to come back into the story because that's my favorite part so far but that's probably just me so I'm really excited about reading the rest of the book the Vanderbeekers of 141st Street this month um, and I hope you are too so We've read the first chapter together. Go ahead and finish the book on your own. Uh, next week, we'll be posting a craft related to the story. Got a couple of good ideas already. And then the week after that, we'll have a book discussion live. So please join us for that and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye.